and segmentation exercise uh, using Fiji. Um, my name is Joel. Uh, I'm, uh, I just finished my PhD in Munich. And when I say I just finished, I mean I literally defended my PhD today. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and to talk about ImageJ, which is basically essentially the tool that I've used the most in, in the past, uh, I guess, five years, possibly more. Um, and so the goal uh, for today's uh, exercise is simply to uh, sort of learn and discuss some of the, the common imaging processes, uh, processing tools uh, that we use in Fiji to uh, threshold and segment images. With the idea of trying to uh, detect objects and doing, uh, getting some quantitative information from, from these objects that we find. Uh, uh, so that will be using our little Fiji window right here. If you've never used Fiji before, we're going to walk you through it. If you've used it, well, uh, you'll get a chance to sort of uh, see how, how, well, see different ways of using it and um, perhaps it compares well or not with, uh, with what you're already doing. Uh, I think you've been provided with some materials. So we, we recommended that uh, all of you had watched uh, two videos by uh, Robert Haase, um, uh, an interesting uh, computational biologist uh, in, in Dresden. And we gave you uh, some images uh, to sort of play around with. Uh, so you can segment the nuclei with the goal of getting the, the, the intensity, the GFP intensities in, um, in, in another image. Uh, so hopefully you've had a chance to either look at those. And if not, no worries, we'll, we'll go through them. And we sent you some, some general guidelines uh, to thresholding and segmentation. Uh, you'll notice that we've been purposefully uh, a little vague. Uh, so we didn't tell you exactly what to, what to do. Uh, and the idea was just to, to get you kind of into Fiji and kind of look a little bit for these, uh, for these functions throughout the, the menus and the buttons. Um, and so at this point, uh, there's sort of two little things that I want to point out. Uh, on the one hand, essentially there's no image analysis pipeline that is, that is perfect. Uh, almost in all cases, uh, there'll be some erroneous uh, segmentation, meaning that you'll get a bunch of false positives and false negatives. And it's, it's really hard to get something that's 100% perfect. Um, but it's up to you to be aware of you know, what, sort of, uh, uh, what sort of mistakes are happening and whether or not that is uh, relevant or crucial to, your, uh, to, to your, the type of analysis that you're doing. So don't worry if we do miss a cell every once in a while. Um, and the other thing is that if you, uh, if you do a lot of these tutorials or if you do a lot of the uh, exercises uh, yourself or you do a lot of analysis yourself, you'll notice that there's a lot of ways to carry out the image processing to get the objects that you're, that you're looking for. Um, and it's the same for almost any uh, image analysis process. So um, what we might be doing is different than what you'd be doing or what other people would be doing. Uh, but the idea is just to sort of get an idea of different ways to do it and try to figure out what would be best for your particular application. So don't worry if this, this is not what you've been uh, taught to do, essentially, uh, initially. Um, and so with that, uh, I think we'll, uh, we can briefly pause there. Um, we, will, we will start. I'll give you a little overview of what we want to do today, and then we'll start with the actual practical aspects of, of it. Um, so Anne-Marie and Michiel, are there, do you, does anybody have any questions or concerns? Does this sound OK to people? People sound pretty quiet. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah, so, so far, so good. So should, far, so should good. Should we ask how the I'd go on when maybe um, when you looked at the images and try to follow the the different step? Yeah, exactly. So yes, uh, so we'll 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 go through all that. Um, that's a good point. Uh, I guess we'll do a few, I'll do a few steps practically in ImageJ right here, and I'll talk you through that, and then we'll take a little break, we'll let you guys do it, and then uh, you can ask us questions as, as you're going along. And um, yeah, we'll be able to sort of, uh, and hopefully it can be interactive. So if things are going too fast, please tell me. If things are really unclear, please let us know, and we'll try to answer your questions um, as we go. So uh, just to give you a brief overview of what uh, we're thinking of doing today, um, so without going into the details, or without going into the details just yet, what we want to do is to take a, an image of nuclei that can look something like this, and then uh, segment them in such a way to get these individual shapes. So create some sort of binary image that would look like this, whoops, that would look like this. And then from these shapes here, apply these shapes onto a different image, let's say a, a GFP image, um, get the shapes of those nuclei and get the intensities from these different, uh, these different areas here. And so you can get um, and just get the, the intensity information. Um, so I'll walk you through all of this, uh, the basic process of this. Um, we suggested that you, that you listen to some videos about filtering, uh, filtering processes. 
If we have time, we'll get to those. Um, but the idea but, uh, for uh, filtering, just to give you a, a quick look, is that, well, you'll notice that these images are, are fairly high signal to noise, so they're relatively easy to work with. However, you will encounter cases where noises are much more, uh, images are much more noisy. So uh, you can see here that there's a lot of, uh, that the signal is less strong compared to the noise. Or you'll also encounter images where you have a high background fluorescence. So more like wide field imaging, where you can see that, well, kind of things are all kind of brighter and hazier in the center. And so hopefully we'll get to uh, talking about how we can sort of deal with these, uh, these types of, of issues in our images. So I'll close all this. And we'll start over. Uh, we don't need this, and we don't need this. So, um, so first, well, we need to have our, our Fiji window open, and Fiji is simply this tiny little window here. And to, to, to briefly get it, give you an introduction, um, essentially, you should see something like this on your screen if you have a Mac. And if you have a Mac, you have uh, all the menus at the top, so file, edit, image, process, and so on. If you have a Windows computer, um, those, those menus should be in the, the Fiji window itself. So essentially all the functions that we're doing are kind of hidden in all these menus and sub menus and, and, and what have you. And uh, some of the, some of the uh, more quickly usable uh, functions are, are in this toolbar here. So these different buttons uh, uh, all over here. So we're gonna go ahead and open one of our images and we can do that. We'll open the, um, the, the hoaxed file. So the file name that ends with hoaxed.tiff, which happens to be the, uh, the uh, DNA stain nuclei that we have. So we can just drag and drop right into the, the Fiji window here. And it's a, it's a small image, it's a single image. So it should be pretty easy. It should be pretty quick to load. Um, so the image loads, you'll see it's most likely red. Uh, you probably see red nuclei on your screen and that's kind of encoded in the, uh, in the, the metadata. Um, however, this, this image was acquired on a simple monochrome camera. So this red is just for, for, for visual purposes um, since it was part of a multicolor image. Um, so we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, if, you, if you bring your mouse over the image, you can see that there's a, a few numbers that are changing on the, uh, on the main Fiji window, sort of at the top here. So this main Fiji window here, you can see there are numbers. So X has a number to it, Y has a number, and there's a value. And this is simply the XY coordinate where my, my mouse currently is. So I can move all the way over here. And the value at the end is of course the pixel intensity value. So how, which is uh, kind of a readout of how many photons were detected uh, by, this, uh, by this pixel on the camera. And so of course, things that are brighter will have a higher uh, intensity value than uh, things that are dimmer, such as the background. Um, it's generally su suggested that when you're working on uh, a single channel image, so in this case, we just have this DNA stain, uh, we generally recommend to just work in, in, in grayscale. So not have these, these colorful LUTs such as the red or, uh, or others, just because it's a little bit more straightforward to see the, the subtle differences in, in intensities. So to do that, um, you can you select your window and uh, you, uh, on this top, uh, this top menu here, you click on image. Then you go to the lookup tables submenu, and we're going to choose grays. So the lookup tables is essentially the, uh, the, the color coding for these different pixel intensity values. So going from black all the way to either red or green, or in this case, all the way to white. And so this gives us a, a simply gives us a sort of a black and white image to work with. Um, note that changing the LUT does not change the intensity values. So this is just uh, this is just for for visual purposes here. How the image is being um, displayed on the screen. Um, next, again, just as a a brief introduction, um, it's usually a good idea to have a look at the at the histogram. So what are the what is the range of intensity values that we do get in our image? Because we get, well, we say that this is, these are dark or these are dim, we say these are bright, um, but what is the distribution of intensities? And to do that, it's usually helpful to just have a look at the, at the intensity histogram. And to get that in an image today, it's very simple. You click on analyze, and then you go down to histogram here. So pretty direct. And we'll click on that. And here you'll see a histogram of the intensities here. So it's a frequency histogram um, of the intensities in this image. And it gives you an idea of the values that we're dealing with here. So the, the minimum value, the, the, the dimmest pixel in the image is, uh, is at 442 gray values. Um, so it's uh, all the way over here, there's not many. And the maximum intensity value is uh, 19,648. So that just gives us an idea of the range of values. And if we look at the frequency here, uh, we have a, a peak kind of early on here around uh, 600, around, yeah, around 600 uh, gray values. And uh, this, would, this, generally, this, this whole peak here generally represents 
um, the, the background values here. So there's a lot of pixels that have this sort of background value here around 500, 600, um, something like that. And then we have this, this, this sort of uh, further peak here, which is generally going to be our, our signal. So we have this, uh, this sort of concentration of higher signals here with this peak around 2000. And sure enough, if we go in these nuclei and kind of look around, we have values between here's 1800, uh, here's 1600 and 2000 and so forth. So this kind of tells you that already we have a, a kind of a clear definition uh, or sort of a visible definition between the background and, and our signal. And this is going to be useful for, uh, for thresholding a little bit later. And finally, um, to look at our images, again, just from a, a visual point of view, uh, it can be handy to, to adjust the contrast, which I have open here. So I'll, I'll close it and start over again. Uh, to, to get the, the contrast adjustments, you click on Image, Adjust, and then Brightness and Contrast. Um, this will open that the little window. So Image, Adjust, Brightness and Contrast. This will uh, open up this B and C window. You'll see we get a, a smaller version of the histogram here. And we have essentially four sliders and a, and a few buttons here. Now, what you can do is just play a little bit with these sliders and you'll see that the, the display contrast changes. And this can be helpful to sort of uh, be able to visually see some details uh, better than the others. So if you really want to see the noise in the background, then you can crank the intensity. If you really just want to see your cells, you can do that. And what I, what's important to note from this, this is only for visual purposes. So this is only what you see on your screen. Uh, you can make things brighter or dimmer. Um, it does not affect the pixel values so long as you use the sliders, auto, or reset. So if you use the sliders, the auto button, or the reset button, um, you do not affect the pixel values. And so uh, I would just recommend that if you want to change the, the contrast, you use these, the sliders, and auto, or reset. And at least during analysis, try to avoid clicking on set or apply, simply because these will actually change the pixel values of your image and can make your analysis a little more difficult when you're finding uh, thresholds and trying to apply similar processes to many images. Um, these buttons can be really useful when you're trying to generate figures or gener generate uh, representative images for to, to put, say, in your in your talk or in a figure. Um, so this was kind of the the. the the basic kind of introduction to, 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 to working in ImageJ is essentially you have a window open and you'll have a myriad of functions uh, kind of hidden in these, in these, uh, these menus. Um, and you're essentially just gonna go through these one after another. Um, so perhaps at right now, I'll, we'll pause a little bit. Um, now I'd invite you to open up ImageJ and just open up the, the, the image and try to play around a little bit with the contrast, get the histogram, adjust the, the LUT to get it gray. And uh, we'll come back and we'll continue in a, in a couple of minutes with the, uh, the thresholding. And we'll, of course, we'll answer questions if there are some. Oh, and thank you all for your kind wishes with regards to, I guess, my PhD defense. I'm reading all the congratulations now. That's very sweet. <laughs> Sure, well, there is a question in the chat. Um, someone asking if you do hit apply and change the pixel value, is there a way to undo? Let me unmute myself. Um, that is a good question, The uh, but it brings up a, a really good point. Um, 
So we can just go ahead and try it. Uh, the undo function in Fiji is uh, is not uh, is not always great. So it doesn't work on all functions, and it certainly doesn't work on previously used functions. So let me just share my screen, and we can give it a try kind of directly. Uh, so um, suppose we create a kind of wild contrast and say apply. Uh, we now have changed our intensity values dramatically, and if I say undo. Um, the undo function seems to work there, I think. Yes, um, so that will work. I don't think it'll work for set, but set should pop up a new window where you do adjust things uh, accordingly. So we can give that a try as well, say okay. Okay, so the undo will, oh. The undo doesn't seem to work all that well with uh, the set, but that, that loads another window that you should cancel. So in the event that you do uh, that, um, I would just close the window. Uh, don't save it and uh, and open it up again. And you'll notice that we, we tend to do that very often uh, in, in Fiji, just either closing the window or often we work on uh, duplicates of the window, essentially, um, which we'll get to in, in a couple of minutes. Um, okay. So maybe if everyone is um, good to go forward, you can hit the yes button in the participant window. If not, we can hold off a bit longer. Yep, we can totally wait. We can also take thumbs up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, the direct feedback is nice. Cool. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Shall we move on a little bit? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. So, um, so again, this was just to get you used to uh, working around in, in, in ImageJ a little bit. Um, for now, I'm going to close the histogram. This was just to kind of uh, consult and see what's going on. And now we'll start um, um, working with the image a little bit to, to, to get sort of the, the shapes of uh, these nuclei um, in order to get do some some get some 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 measurements out of the uh, out of our GFP image. So. Um, as you noticed, uh, we sort of discussed this undo, uh, the undo button, if we do functions that, that work or don't work. And um, since undo doesn't always work all that well, um, it's, it's usually a good idea to duplicate the image or to work on a, on a duplicate of the image. So I'll do that right now. This is the original image here. Um, to do that, we're gonna click on image and duplicate. Um, and you'll notice that for a lot of these things, there are shortcuts that you will most likely, uh, if you do that, use these a lot, you'll learn to use them by heart. Um, so we'll just do that, image duplicate. Uh, it'll offer us to, to, to put a different title, um, but it will automatically add a dash one and iterate that number as we duplicate the image. So we can just essentially leave it as it is and say, okay. Um, and we have this new image here. So that way, if we do make a mistake or do something strange or try a filter that doesn't work out, we can just close this, go back to our, our original image and uh, duplicate it again. So um, what we want to do now is uh, sort of figure out a way to get these images, uh, to get these uh, the objects of these nuclei. And so um, the, there are many different ways to do this. The, 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 uh, the, the simplest one is to try to find, to try to establish a threshold. So simply uh, an intensity value um, that would delineate between the, uh, the, background, uh, the background of the image and the signal. And so that can be kind of straightforward, but can, can be kind of tricky depending on the background and, and the noise and, and this and that. Um, so, we'll, so this image should be relatively easy to work with. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and give that a try. To do that in Fiji in a very st simple, straightforward way of simply establishing a threshold, we can click on image and then adjust and uh, threshold. So we're not going to use color threshold, just image adjust threshold. Um, so uh, control shift T or command shift T. And this should open up a little window and uh, possibly make your pixels red. Don't worry if they make your pixels red. This is good. Um, 
And so essentially here we get a repetition of our, of our histogram here, and we have these two sliders that would allow us, if we wanted to, to manually select a threshold. So essentially everything within uh, this, uh, this red box here is going to be the, the pixels that would be above threshold or maintained essentially. So if we take this, uh, this slider here, we can change that box here, which also changes the, the amount of pixels that would be selected, which in our image are indicated in red. So we can we can establish a very low threshold and keep everything, which is not so useful, a very high threshold if we're trying to get those uh, dense heterochromatin centers in the, in the cell. But uh, for today, we sort of want to get those, um, those nuclei. Um, so in reality, you can, if you wanted to, uh, set a, a threshold manually. So you could play with, you could adjust the slider until you get something that you, that you think is right or looks good for your purposes, and then choose that intensity value as a, as a threshold. Um, and that could be handy to sort of quickly go through your image or quickly get a, a rough estimate of, of uh, a sort of rough measurement. Um, but typically what we do is, is try to figure out a, a way to uh, sort of more systematically determine the threshold uh, on, the, on the intensity values of the image. And so you can imagine there are a lot of ways to do that. We could take simply the, the median value, or we could take the, 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 uh, the mean value of the image, or we could do different sort of calculations and computations to try to find what the center of these two peaks is. You could try to fit uh, two different curves and try to find the, the middle point between these distributions. Um, yeah? Someone has a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, somebody asks, uh, they have a background that becomes red and the nuclei stays black. Ah, okay. Um, sorry about that. Yes. Uh, so in this threshold, if you're, if you have kind of the invert image, it's possible that you do not have dark background clicked in. So if I do that, I would do the same thing. So very often by default, it thinks that, uh, you know, dark pixels are, are, are signal and uh, white pixels are black. So what you want to do for a traditional fluorescence image is have a dark background clicked in. And then it's, it's going to assume that those, uh, those you know, dark pixels are, are, are what you want to avoid. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Um, so uh, so if we have dark background clicked in, then we can see that well, these the, the, the pixels in red are the ones that are going to be kept. Um, and so in terms of uh, systematically choosing a threshold, again, as since doing manually, we can have different computations do it. And Fiji sort of provides you with a list of different uh, possible uh, computations here. Um, the most commonly used ones, uh, what I think are the most commonly used ones, are one called Otsu, um, which I don't quite know how what exactly how the, the, the math of the function, but it tries to find the trough between two distributions. Um, and as well, a lot of people use this triangle method here, which tries to find the center of a triangle between, I think, the, the background peak and the, some of the maximum intensity values. Um, for today, though, instead of using those, we can simply use the, the mean intensity. So essentially, what is the mean intensity of uh, the image? So averaging all the pixels together, and then just saying everything that's above that mean intensity is signal, is an object that we want and everything below is, uh, is background. And that's just one of the many options here. Um, later on, we'll, we will talk about the different, um, uh, different computations of this threshold that you can use that may work better with the type of images that you have. But for now, just to write, run through this, uh, this we'll, 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 we'll go through this. So um, turns out that in this image, the, choosing the mean intensity as a threshold is a, is a pretty good start. And so um, we can apply this, and we can, we can use this. And uh, simply to continue with this, if we're satisfied with this type of, uh, type of segmentation, we can continue. When I say satisfied, I mean, well, we get most of our nuclei. So there, uh, and we get, you know, it's, it's mostly complete. Some of the nuclei have, have holes in it, or spots that aren't, uh, areas that aren't really um, uh, above threshold, but we can deal with those. Um, and we don't have much in terms of pixels in the background. There's a little bit of background here, but you can notice that there are a lot of individual pixels that we'll be able to deal with fairly easily. So, um, so to me, this would be generally satisfying. And importantly, we don't have any nuclei that are touching each other and thereby making a continuous object. It is possible to split up objects into smaller objects if they, suppose we had a, a lower threshold here. You can see that some of these perhaps not so much. Uh, you can see that some of these, uh, these objects would be in contact with each other. Um, but then this makes for nice sort of clean, separable, ob separ separatable objects that uh, should be um, reasonable to work with. Um, Joel? Yes. There was a question. I think you 
answer it mostly on how to choose the best threshold function. Mm -hmm. um, if I can, I mean, in general, I think the answer is that it has the um, it has mistakes in there that you know you can fix afterwards. Would that be a good uh, way yeah. to choose it, or exactly? Yeah, that's the yes, that would be perfect. So in this case, um, it is relatively easy to deal with. Um, with individual pixels, such as this one over here or, or these ones over here. We know that we'll be able to deal with those problems there. Uh, if there are uh, spots, that areas that are missing within an object, so for example, these, these uh, non-red pixels inside this nucleus here, we can deal with those easily. Um, so, so, and those are the main things that are very easy to deal with without having to, to trust difficult computations or anything like that. Um, so the best uh, threshold function is, is going to be the one that works, and that's going to depend on your on the type of uh, the type of image that you have. So in this case, we can deal with this. You could imagine if we didn't have such variance uh, of intensity within the nuclei. So our nuclei have some really bright spots and some really dim spots. Perhaps a different threshold could work better. Um, but in this case, the mean seems to work better just fine. So it's really trying them out and seeing what sort of results you can get reliably on multiple images one after another. Um, I guess the important thing is to be consistent between images. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you're analyzing a data set, you want to make sure that you're analyzing all these things the same way. So you try to choose the one that, that works best for you. Um, you'll notice that at this initial thresholding step, it's, it's not perfect. And so uh, we'll try to do some processing afterwards to make it a little bit better. And uh, later on, we can also show some, some pre-processing steps that can also make the thresholding a little bit easier as well. Um, so as we're trying to find this sort of balance of, of that that will generate sort of robustly and reliably uh, generate results. Um, yeah. So if we're happy with this, uh, with these intensities here, or sorry, with these, this, this thresholding pattern here, um, we can say apply, and this is going to change our image. So currently our image is still, uh, is still our original image with all ex the, the regular pixel intensity values. And you can see that, well, these sort of areas here are dim at 600. And if I hover over these red pixels here, they're still around 3000, so it's still actually the nucleus. Once I click apply, this is gonna change this image to a binary image. So I'm gonna do this right now, give you a, to show you. So click apply, and we should get this black and white image. And here, the values are completely different. It's a binary image, meaning that there's only two values throughout the whole image. We have either zero for the background, so I can hover through here and all the values are zero, or we have the maximum value of 255 for all these white pixels here. And now if you think of a computer that doesn't really, you know, that doesn't really do any, any thinking at the moment, now it becomes very easy to sort of separate what is, uh, it really, it becomes very easy for the computer to say, okay, the objects that are, you know, 255 are, are objects and objects that is, what is zero is, is not an object or is a background. Um, okay. So now we have this image here, which are all essentially zeros and ones, or zeros and 255s. And so now we sort of want to uh, work a little bit with our threshold image to make it a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more robust. Uh, so some of the issues that we do have are these uh, small pixels here, and um, we'll, we'll get to those later on. We have objects that didn't quite threshold. So for example, this nucleus here, in addition to being on the edge, seems to be kind of separate little uh, little chunks, so we'll, we'll deal with that. And then we want to make sure that we, in this case, that we get the, the whole area of a nucleus. So, you know, we want to measure and we want to get region of interest that include, uh, you know, these pixels that are currently black. Um, so once we have a binary image, we can do these uh, morphological uh, uh, operations on, on these, which simply means that we can sort of consider the geometry and either fill them up or expand them in a variety of ways. So the, the simplest one that we're going to do right now is simply to fill these holes. And holes are essentially um, well things like this, where you have these dark pixels within a continuous uh, thresholded um, uh, object or geometrical shape. And so for this, we'll click on uh, process, then binary, which is a bunch of operations that can be done on uh, binary images. And uh, we'll click on fill holes, very simply. So we'll click on that. And you'll see that it managed to fill up um, many of these uh, many of these nuclei. It didn't quite get this one, um, but that's okay. We can decide whether or not that's a problem. And this is kind of a the typical situation that we'll have to deal with. Um, and so now we have kind of these these continuous areas here that we're going to want to get intensities out of. Uh, so 
what we can do is um, there are multiple ways to sort of get get this information. Uh, the, I think the simplest to get it from the entire image is to use the analyze particles function, which is what we're going to do right now. So if we click on, um, oops, seems people are having problems with fill holes. Uh, so let me just undo this. Oops. Um, I think it again has to do with the foreground and background issue after thresholding. Ah, okay. Um, that's a good question. So there is a uh, there's occasionally a funny behavior of of uh, Fiji that will consider foreground and background differently. So not purely on the intensity values, but on the display uh, colors. So in some cases, it can help. Um, to fill the holes if you invert the, uh, the lookup table. So I'll just duplicate my image here. Um, to do that, you can click on image uh, lookup tables and simply say invert LUT. Whoops, there we go. And so you'll get, uh, and if you do that, you should get um, uh, black uh, nuclei over a, over a white background. And in some cases, this can work a little bit better uh, with the, the fill holes function. And I'll give it a try right now, perhaps. Uh, right. <laughs> so for me, it's the opposite. Everything disappears. Um, uh, so <laughs> so if you had that problem, we'll just have to, to start over again. Uh, so uh, this is why you we... Should, you should use edit invert. Then it will do, yeah. You can use edit invert. That will change the, uh, the values. So then the background would become 255 and the foreground will become zero. So that can work in some cases. You can also use, uh, if you just invert the LUT, um, that can work as well, simply because then uh, the values will remain the same and that uh, the background will still be zero. Um, but I think in this case, both, both processes would work, yeah. Um, so perhaps what we can do is, all right. Right. Um, so if this happened to you and you lost most of your nuclei, we can just start over. Uh, so go back to your original image and we'll simply go sequentially through it. And this is a good exercise. And it also shows you some of the, uh, the idiosyncrasies of, of, uh, of image J. There are a few functions like that that uh, will work, seem to, work, to detect more of the foreground and background color rather than the pixels. And there's a few things like that that we sort of have to get used to. So let's uh, duplicate this image. So uh, image duplicate, say okay. Um, I already have my threshold window here uh, open, but that would be image adjust uh, threshold. And uh, we'll select, make sure the dark background is selected. We'll click on mean in terms of computing the, uh, the background, uh, computing the threshold. We'll hit auto. This looks like it's supposed to. We'll click apply. And then maybe just to be sure, I will duplicate this uh, binary image. So again, image and duplicate. You can end up with a lot of open windows with, the, with Fiji, um, but usually this is just the first time when you're trying to figure out uh, exactly how to set your thresholds and, and all that. Um, and then just to uh, compare, I will do, uh, yeah, let's, let's do it on both. So I'll, I'll invert this image here. So, uh, so image, lookup tables, invert LUT, and then, we want to fill up the holes and we'll, we'll see that there, there are the difference. So if I fill holes here on my system, uh, so process binary fill holes, we get these nice complete nuclei. Whereas here, um, I think it's in interpreting the, the white as the foreground. And so if we do process binary and fill holes, we get a few things that disappear. So um, you'll have, depending on the foreground and background color settings on your system, you'll get one or, one or two of these, uh, these, um, these options. Oh, yes. And so um, in some cases, applying the threshold will give you an inverted LUT. Um, I believe some of these settings are, uh, are here in edit options and um, hmm. 
I don't quite remember. Uh, possibly in colors. Right, so foreground white and background black for me. So, um, so you may have inverted settings here where the, the, the foreground can be black and the background white, and selections are usually yellow. Um, in any case, you just have to sort of figure out which one, what works for you. Okay. Um, has this mostly worked for people? Have people managed to get um, uh, an image with a binary image with kind of filled nuclei? Seeing a couple of thumbs up, this is great. Okay. Oh, um, I can answer your question. Uh, so where the, where the foreground background? Um, uh, we can we'll write this down, but uh, so it, it's an edit, uh, options, and then colors is where you can adjust these. So this can be, uh, it can be useful to change this. Um, in most cases, we kind of leave it as it is and you just kind of, uh, or you kind of figure out the setting that you want. You're just gonna kind of use the setting for, uh, for a while. <laughs> All right. So now that we have these, um, we have these these nice sort of continuous uh, areas here uh, of our of our nuclei. So now we want to um, essentially get the geometrical shape. So what are the coordinates of the the edges here to then just go apply them onto another image? So for example, uh, an image taken in a different channel. Um, and so there there are many ways to do this. Uh, the the simplest way uh, just by using the um, uh, just by using the, 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 the native functions of Fiji, would be um, analyze and uh, then, whoops, and then analyze particles. We'll click on that. And then you get this, uh, this window here, um, the analyze particles window. And so you have a few options here and we'll, we'll go through them. Um, you can, you can set a size restriction. So it's gonna find individual objects that are closed, so that are continuous with these thresholded, uh, this thresholded signal. Um, and you can, you can set a, a limit on size. So suppose you don't want anything too big or anything too small. You can put a size uh, exclusion here, which we will in a, in a moment, which can be either in uh, squared microns if you have a calibrated image. So if, the, if Fiji recognizes that uh, your images are in, well, uh, have a certain pixel size in microns. Alternatively, you can just click on pixel units here. Um, you can give it a circularity. So if you do end up thresholding and you have, uh, and you're looking for very round objects like uh, nuclei, but you end up having also a few strange objects that have a different shape, you can kind of limit them here. Um, for the moment, we don't want to, we don't want to show anything. We just want to get these, these, uh, these shapes. And, um, here in the, in these selections here, uh, I would suggest, um, you can, you can click on clear results. So get rid of any sort of measurements that you had uh, in, the, uh, in the results table, which we have not really opened yet. Um, importantly, you wanna say add to manager, and this will become clear in a little bit. Basically, we wanna get each one of these images, to uh, each one of these shapes to be able to apply it to another image. And that usually takes place through the, um, the, uh, the ROI manager. And then um, typically, we want to have uh, exclude on edges here. And so the reason here is just that, well, typically for analysis, you don't really want to get the, inf very often you don't want to get the information from cells or objects that are right on the e edge. So for example, this cell here, this top cell, um, you know, part of, part of it is missing. So we are missing information. Uh, so it's not ideal to keep that uh, in, our, in our data set on the one hand. And, um, and on the other hand, sometimes depending on the type of acquisition you have, you can have some artifacts right at the edge of the, of the image on the, either the first line of pixels, or the first row or the first column of pixels. So sometimes there the information would be strange as well. Um, let me just have a look. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and we're getting some good, uh, some good feedback on, on the invert LUT. So either changing the pixel values or just changing how the, uh, how the screen displays the, the values, which is good. And again, show us some of the, 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 the subtleties of, uh, of image shape, which can be kind of difficult at first, but we kind of learn to, to deal with. Um, so uh, we'll just hit our analyze part. So we'll, we'll leave these results, uh, these, uh, these settings as they are. So we'll, we'll take all the, just to, to have a look, We'll, we'll take in all the particles, so from zero to infinity. Um, we'll take all, 
take all the particles regardless of their shape, zero to one circularity. Uh, we'll clear the results, we'll add them to manager and exclude on edges and uh, just say okay and kind of see what this, what this does. And so this is good, not great as you can see. Um, so on the one hand, we have a few very, very nice large nuclei here. So number for me, it's number 201 here is very nice, 211, this and that. But you notice that we have a lot of very tiny ROIs corresponding to those kind of individual pixels or uh, little bits of noise or kind of a sort of lower intensity nuclei and bits of nuclei here and there. Um, so we don't really want those most of the time. It's, it's Good to know that they are there, that we're capable of finding them, but uh, for the purpose of this analysis, we really only want to keep the, uh, the nuclei that, that we get a, a complete signal of. So what we'll do is um, do the analyzed particles again, and this was just to kind of get you to, to see what this, this window might look like. I'm going to select all the, 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 the regions of interest and delete them. So now they're all gone. And so we'll do this again, but we'll put in a, a size uh, parameter essentially to get rid of, uh, of the, the, those tiny ones. Um, before doing that, I'll just, uh, so I have a, these are, these are images that, that I, I've taken, so I have an idea what the sizes are, uh, for if you, if you're not quite certain, um, you can take the, the square, click on the, the first square button here, um, and then you can just draw a square on, on your image, essentially of any size. And if you look in the, uh, the Fiji window, um, you'll get the, the height, the width and the height of the square. So currently I'm at, uh, let's see. Currently I'm at uh, 52 pixels and uh, I'm at 100 pixels and this and that. So just by doing this, you can get sort of an idea of uh, what is the shape or what is the size of some of your, uh, some of your nuclei. Those values are, are uh, sort of appear when you're actually drawing it or when you're sort of moving it around. Um, ah, uh, there's a question about selecting all the ROIs. You, uh, if I have multiple ROIs, so I'll just make a few artificial ones here, just with the square. Um, you can click on the first one, hold down shift, click on the last one, <laughs> and uh, delete them, uh, quite simply. You can use command A and D, yes, so you can do that as well. Command or control A will work. Uh, you just want to make sure that you do that in the ROI manager, because control A will also select the whole image, and if you delete that, well, you'll lose your, your information. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, you delete the ROIs. Uh, another uh, you know, useful, uh, a default setting of Fiji is um, all these functions that we're using, you'll notice they only apply to the active image. So the image that's sort of on the foreground that's being edited. So whenever we did analyze particles, it's not doing that on, on an image back here or anything like that. So that's kind of handy and perhaps intuitive. Um, another particularity is that suppose you did have a selection. So if you had a, a nucleus selected from when we did create particles, or if you have a square selected or any region of interest that's selected that will typically be in yellow on your screen, um, Fiji will apply uh, the, uh, any function to that region of interest that is currently selected. So I can give you an example. Suppose I put this box around uh, this nucleus here and I said, analyze, analyze particles. I said, just left the, these things like this. I say, okay, we only get this one uh, nucleus here. So we don't get the others. Um, so when you are using ROIs, it's either just to uh, determine the size or you had ROIs that were selected, it's important to go on your image and um, make sure that there's nothing selected. Uh, and you can just see if you're, if you're unsure, take the box, draw a box, and then make the box disappear. Uh, okay. And I'll delete this. So um, let's go back and analyze our particles again. So we'll say uh, analyze, analyze particles. And here we'll put a size filter based on, on what we saw. So um, most of these uh, nuclei can contain a 50 by 50 uh, pixel box or a 40 by 40. Um, so we can put that as, as, a, as a minimal size. Uh, of, uh, and this, this, these measurements were in pixels, of course, and usually it gets kind of easier to work in pixels and then do the conversions later. Um, so we'll just put a, a size constraint here of say um, 2,500 pixels uh, to infinity. So anything under 2,500 pixels will not be uh, considered. And we'll keep that in pixel units because, uh, well, that would, not be, uh, that would not fit in microns. So now with this, um, 
And again, with uh, Add to Manager and Exclude on Edges selected, we can click OK. And now we should get you know, a pretty good selection of, uh, of, of nuclei. Um, so now we only have uh, 12 regions of interest for 12 objects that were found. Um, the first one is imperfect, but this is kind of normal. We could change the size filter to try to get rid of it, um, but that's just going to be kind of part of our analysis. So we can make the, the size that 2,500 2, larger, uh, but the other ones are, are quite good. And so this kind of showcases a little bit the type of errors that will, false positives or false negatives that will appear in this. Um, you'll notice as well that this nucleus at the top here and this one here were excluded from, from our analysis simply because, well, uh, they're, they're on the edge and we, we told the, the system to exclude on edges. Um, so this is good. Uh, we have a bunch of regions of interest and the, the ROI manager here, you have all these functions here, that, uh, the, all these, uh, these regions of interest, they will highlight what they are on the screen, but these are actually uh, stored pieces of information of, uh, of these shapes that can then be applied to uh, essentially any other image. Um, so I'll just pause there for a second. All right. Um, and so we'll just make sure that everyone, I'll, we'll just pause for a second. Is everyone doing okay? Has everyone managed to get at least a few, uh, a few nice nuclei out of this using the analyze particles function? And if not, by all means, let us know uh, where you're having problems and we'll, uh, we'll try to help you out. Uh, so someone asked uh, why the top nuclei are not selected. Um, I'm going to answer that very quickly. Uh, when we said uh, analyze particles, we said uh, we clicked in exclude on edges. And so that means exclude any object that's in that's essentially touching the edge uh, or the limit of the image here. Um, so that's why they're not selected here. We typically do that because uh, you know we don't have the complete information on this nucleus, but then depending on the type of analysis you're doing, perhaps that doesn't matter so much. Uh, but in this case, they were ignored because they were touching the, the edge. Well, I know some programs will um, skip things touching two of the edges, but not the other two as kind of a way to even out um, objects so that, you know, if they're top, touching the top or the left, they're okay, but the bottom and the right, it won't. Do you mm. know if there's an option to do it that way? Uh, in the analyze particle setting, I don't believe there is. Um, this would be the type of thing that uh, Perhaps in a later webinar, if we, when we do talk about uh, scripting, we can add these uh, these provisions and these conditions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> alternatively, we could keep all we could write it ourselves to first keep all those objects and then filter out based on uh, things like touching two edges or uh, other factors. Yeah, but I don't think it does it natively here. Um, so perhaps we'll pause here just to make sure everyone. Uh, gets the, these nuclei. Uh, make sure you, you know, if you get there, keep your images open, keep the ROI manager open with all the ROIs, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue in a couple of minutes. And of course, we'll, we'll take questions, see what we can do. Um, okay, uh, the ROI manager, those numbers, uh, that's a good question. I don't quite know. Um, so let's have a look. So of course, the first number is just the iteration of the, of the region of interest. So if they go from one to 12, the number next to that though, let's have a look. Um, and just have a quick look. So suppose we measure a few of these. Hmm. It, I, thought, I thought it encoded either the, something about the position of the, um, of the region of interest, but I can't quite see it in these in the in the measurements that I've taken here. So uh, and we'll we'll get to Did measure. Oh no, not even the Y here. Not quite, huh? Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't quite know. Uh, I don't quite know. So we'll we'll certainly Google that and uh, and try to figure that out. That's a good question. 
I believe we can rename these regions of interest as well. Uh, if that if that is helpful, you can rename that, you know, goat cells or something like that. Um, there's one question about segmenting part of a cell instead of a whole cell. Um, and that's kind of a, uh, we, perhaps we can talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Um, it'll sort of depend on your images. So uh, if we go back to the original image, we can, we can just talk about this kind of freely uh, for, for a moment. Uh, for something like this, you could imagine perhaps you'd be not interested only in the whole nucleus, but really in these, these, these bright, uh, these are, these, this is a heterochromatin, so maybe you're, you're really interested in these, these bright things. So the idea would be to find a threshold that only includes uh, those, those regions there. Um, so if we, uh, if we click on our, on our threshold thing here, you could, you know, adjust the slider to try to only get those those subsections there, um, and uh, in order to get this kind of in an automated fashion, then uh, there are multiple ways. Maybe you can find uh, a way to determine that this is a threshold, uh, and, a, and another way would be to try to um, do segmentation in multiple steps. So, for example, if you threshold uh, a nucleus of some sort, which we've already done, so say something like that, and then you try to uh, apply a second threshold within this, it's going to try to find, it, and again, uh, use the mean as a threshold, it would apply the threshold only to the mean of these, uh, uh, of these uh, intensity values here. So, um, so then if we have, for example, this nucleus selected and we'll click auto on the mean, well, we get some of these. Perhaps the mean is not the best here, uh, but we could find uh, other ways of, of figuring this out. So for example, running an otsu locally uh, only within the nucleus, then we can, uh, we can get that information there. So often it can be uh, multiple steps of, of thresholding to find a threshold after following finding a threshold, et cetera. Oops. Um, the nucleus is part of a cell. Yes, I, I tend to, when, when, when I'm working in image day, I tend to sort of, uh, Throw them all objects and nuclei and cells uh, all, all in the same bucket. Uh, so yes, these are these are nuclei. We're segmenting nuclei, uh, the part of the cell. Um, and then here we have a, an interesting comment. Yes, uh, so um, that uh, so Yusuf said usually cells won't be as nicely spread as they are on this image, uh, and they will be in contact with one another. So how do you separate between uh, touching cells? Um, that's going to go a little bit beyond what we're going to what we're going to discuss today. Uh, that is certainly an issue, uh, which can be based on how the images were taken, or simply the nature of the the sample that we're imaging with cells that are overlapping and very close together, or in some sort of three D structure. Um, so. Briefly, there are uh, computational functions or analytical functions to uh, separate objects. Uh, one of them is called uh, watershed, which tries to find a way to split uh, a large object into two. Um, I'm not so sure how well this implementation works in, in Fiji, um, but they do exist and they certainly can be implemented in, in, in Python and in MATLAB. Uh, more recently, uh, some of the, the, the methods to, to address these uh, involve machine learning. So um, one of the recent ones that came out, and I believe there's a really nice webinar online from uh, Neudias in, in, in uh, Germany, is called Stardist. And so this uses uh, machine learning algorithms to try to sort of go over the images and really uh, split out uh, closely or even overlapping cells into separate things. So these are, um, these are tools that you can, you can try to figure out if they, if they can work for, for your particular uh, purposes. The other um, factor you have to take into account is when you're gonna analyze them this way, um, you could try to seed your cells more sparsely and try to you know, do the experimental setup ideally for the analysis part. So you have to think about the whole pipeline um, before even you know, seeding cells in the, in the lab. Absolutely, right? <clears throat> so, um, you know, you'll see an image, uh, hopefully you're working on some of your images, and perhaps you can think of ways of either preparing the sample or uh, performing the imaging uh, that would make all of this easier. Uh, so either having this, yeah, more sparse cells, uh, higher magnification to get a little bit more distance between the cells. Um, perhaps you would make sure to image fields of view that don't have, you know, uh, either dead cells or debris or stuff like that that could easily be picked up by your, uh, your analysis software. 
Um, yeah, so it, it kind of goes back and forth between the, the analysis should, uh, should influence the acquisition, the acquisition should, should influence the analysis, and you get this sort of uh, uh, feedback loop that happens. Or maybe add a, another marker if you can. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just as an anecdote here, uh, this, these, uh, so these are live cells. They were labeled with um, a reagent called um, SIR DNA. Um, so it's a, it's a hoaxed analog um, labeled with a, a far red dye. And um, depending on our cells, depending how they were seeded, that, that dye you just kind of throw in the cells and uh, it kind of spreads out. But we get a lot of just varying levels of intensity um, between cells. So not in this image, but overall. And so we found that very often for reliable segmentation, it was easier to work with, uh, with different reagents. So either uh, H2B, or even we expressed uh, just a, a nuclear localizational, uh, sorry, a GFP uh, fused to a nuclear localization signal, which would give us kind of a more diffuse uh, signal, which was generally easier to segment than, um, uh, than, than this signal here. Uh, these particular cells have a, a lot of variance in terms of their DNA uh, compaction, so sometimes these, these bright heterochromatin foci do, does make the thresholding difficult as well. So you can think about that as well using different markers or, or different ways to, to do this. Um, Is there a way to smooth the contour? Um, so there are two, two sort of answers to this. Um, there are many, so the, the question is, is there a way to smooth the contour? Uh, because uh, in images we usually think of the nucleus as being round. Um, and there's one person already, already sort of answered. On the one hand, yes, uh, there's a variety of filter, filtering processes that we can do that will uh, smooth out the shapes that we're detecting. And that will be fun to talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, and that will make things a little bit easier and um, well, definitely easier to work with. And you can sort of imagine that if we get kind of smoother contours, it generally means that our, um, our analysis pipeline might be a little bit more reliable. So uh, certainly filtration, uh, filtering processes are, are, are certainly good. Um, what we can also do, and that we won't really talk about today, is that each one of these regions of interest, um, so just these, uh, these outlines here, we can apply other uh, transformations to it. So we can apply just a smoothing uh, kernel, but just on that region of interest there, if we want to get it uh, smoother in that sense. So either to compensate for bright pixels or, or noise or stuff like that. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to those uh, hopefully in a little bit. Um, is everybody kind of set? Has everybody, does everybody have a, um, have their nuclei? Uh, Okay, um, so we've been going for about an hour. Uh, does anybody need more time uh, to, to continue? We can take a break uh, or we can, uh, we can continue um, with the next bit there, depending how, how people are doing. Uh, if you need a, a thumbs up or you need, a, need some help, uh, click on those buttons as, uh, as you feel necessary. There is a little coffee uh, break button in the in the participant window if you feel you need a break. Mm -hmm. So it seems like people are, are all set to continue, I think. Yeah, all right, so let's keep going. Um, so uh, we threshold our images, we have these, these nice uh, shapes and we, we even have uh, sort of recorded these, um, these regions of interest. So these again are, are are the shapes corresponding to uh, sort of the shapes and locations of these um, these nuclei? So um, this can be handy. Uh, so this can be extremely useful because essentially we don't want to measure our thresholded image because you know all these objects are going to have a, an average of two hundred and fifty five because that's what we we threshold it. Uh, but we can then apply these regions of interest to a separate image, um, which we which we provide with you. Um, ah yes. <laughs> So, um, so let's do that. Um, I'll keep this window open. We'll keep our ROI manager open as well. And 
please go ahead and open or drag into Fiji the other image that we provide with you. So these ESCs, WT, um, that end with u1gfp.tiff. And uh, we'll just go throw this here. And so hopefully you see uh, something like this. I'll give you a second to do that. Um, And so this image here, um, as you're as you're loading it, I can just give you some background. So this is uh, these cells are uh, embryonic stem cells that are just maintained in culture, and um, they are genetically labeled with uh, GFP at the ATG uh, start site of a protein called UHRF1. Um, well, UHRF1. So they're UHRF1 GFP cells. Uh, it is a it is a protein involved in DNA methylation, so it is mostly found in the nucleus and um, Kind of funnily enough, depending on the stages of differentiation, uh, you can get extremely varying um, levels of intensity of UHRF1. So this is not uh, sparse labeling or um, or uh, leaky promoters or anything. This is this kind of happens uh, naturally. Um, so uh, and you'll notice that well, this was this was part of a of um, these images were acquired simul almost simultaneously. So. Uh, you know, it was originally a two-channel image where we took one picture in far red, so using a 640 laser for our DNA dye, followed by, at the same area, the same objective, same settings, um, an image with a 48 laser to excite and um, uh, capture the, the, the GFP signal. So essentially, this uh, GFP signal should be inside the nuclei here. And so if you have this opened, um, then we can go ahead and, and, and get some information. Uh, so it's very, very simple, this bit here. Uh, all we can do is take these ROIs from this, this ROI manager. Again, they just encode, encode a shape and a position of the shape. And if you click on your, your GFP window, you go back to your ROI manager window, you can just click on an ROI. And my first one is not so nice, but then um, you can get these uh, regions corresponding to uh, where we found the nuclei in the other channel. And you can just kind of flip through them uh, slowly. And so you can see that, well, there's a nucleus here that really has almost no signal, um, various levels of intensity uh, here, 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 and here. So um, this is kind of a, a pipeline. In, in a lot of settings, you'll figure out a way to generate ROIs from one image, which has some sort of marker for your nucleol for your nucleus or your cell or the object that you want. And then you'll apply those, those regions of interest to another image um, that has the, uh, the, the signal that, you're, you're, that you want to measure. So then to actually uh, get measurements out of these, you can, um, you can just click on one and uh, you can say measure. And if you haven't done that yet, uh, if you haven't taken any measurements yet, um, you'll get a little, little window that pops up. Um, you'll notice that, uh, so you get this window that pops up. This is your results table that just indicates the measurements that were done here. Now, the measurements that you might have might be different than the, the measurements that I have here. And this is not because we have different images. It's simply because that we have to tell image J um, ideally early on in the process, which measurements we, wanna, we want image J to, to compute. Um, because you can imagine that there's a lot of information that we can get from these, these regions here, and uh, we have to tell image J what we want. So I'll go ahead and close these results here. I won't save them for now. And so to do that, you're gonna click on Analyze and um, Set Measurements. So Analyze and Set Measurements. And here you'll see all the, uh, the types of information that uh, ImageJ can natively compute on its own um, within a region of interest or within an image. So, uh, you know, get the area of your cells can be, can be useful. Uh, the mean gray value is going to be the average intensity, uh, average throughout the whole area. Standard deviation can be very handy as well, tell you how broadly variant your signal is. If it's very diffuse, it's going to be um, pretty steady. If it's super varying, like some of these cells here, it's going to be large. Um, and then you can sort of decide what is useful for you. Um, the centroid can be happy, handy, uh, simply because it'll tell you where that information was taken from. And then I would recommend, um, if you're doing 3D images or time lapses or um, uh, sort of multi-dimensional imaging, the stack position can be useful just to have in your data set exactly where in the stack uh, this, uh, this information was taken. And um, I'd suggest putting in display label here, which is also going to add uh, information about the, uh, the the file that was used from which uh, from this was taken. So sometimes, if you you know if you see that some things are completely off, then you can have a look at some of these values here, and you can see oh well the area of a of a certain measurement is terrible. Well, probably that was a mistake. Or you can have a look at the label, and maybe maybe it measured on the wrong file or, or something like that. So these are 
uh, useful information to have. And then depending on what you're doing, perhaps you'll want some of these other measurements here, the min and max value, for example. Um, yeah, so uh, area, mean intensity, and uh, stack position and display label are uh, sort of most likely what you want. And all the other ones here can be extremely useful depending on your on the type of question you have. Uh, for today, we essentially just want to get the, the mean intensity of UHRF1 in these cells. So really all we'll be uh, thinking about is this mean intensity value. So I'll say OK. And then um, instead of clicking each one and saying measure, we can uh, select all of them. Uh, so either by clicking the first one, holding shift, clicking the last one, or again, clicking on one and hitting Control A, which I'm not sure works in my case, but you can select all of them. And if you have all of them selected, again, you can hit measure, and then you'll get uh, the data from each one of these ROIs uh, in, your, in your results table here, which is kind of handy. Um, and so this is the, the label. We said display a label in our measurements, and this is handy. We have the file name, so u1tfp.tif, and we even have the name of the region of interest here uh, relating to the, the ROI or ROI manager. So this is really, really handy. Um, and then we get the intensity data here, uh, so uh, or the, the, the data that was measured from these from these regions um, all over. As you can see, our mean intensity values vary from 613 all the way to uh, I think the maximum here is 974, um, and so that's the average intensity computed within those those areas. Um, this uh, this results table here. Um, it depends what you're what you need to do with it. If you're just if you just need to know kind of quickly what are the intensities to be able to figure out how to do your pipeline, it could be handy just to sort of get a rough idea of what is the the intensity of your of your objects. Um, but if you're doing your, your real analysis, you probably want to take those images and go do something with them. Uh, and typically, those are uh, those are not things that you'll do in, in image J. You can sort of do some plotting in image J, but it's not really great. So usually you'll want to do this in either Excel or MATLAB or Python and so forth. So you can save this as a data table. Um, so if your results table is selected, you can click on File, Save As. And then um, you can go ahead and, and save them either as an XLS file, uh, so a, a tab delimited file that will open up in Excel, or you can also save them as a CSV, so uh, comma separated, um, uh, comma separated variables. Uh, and so that's how you essentially extract the data, uh, and you just save it on your desktop. Um, before going to, to thinking about these things, we'll, we'll play around a little bit. So uh, at this point, you have thresholded images, you have thresholded uh, nuclei, and you got some nice regions of interest, and you got some data from your cells. So what can be really useful is that you want to store that information. So we just talked about saving your results tables, just to be able to access the data in, in different software to have it in the future. I recommend you save your ROIs as well, uh, just because then if there is something strange or you do want to come back, then you can load them up again and see uh, you know, see what the regions of interest are and if there is some discrepancy between um, what you measured and what you think should be happening. So to do that, you, um, you want to have all your ROIs selected. Um, and then you say, click on more and you click on save. If you only have one ROI selected, it'll only save the selected ROI, which can be a pity if you have hundreds of nuclei beautifully uh, segmented. And it, it may very well happen that you make that mistake. I've certainly made that mistake many times. So if you click on save, um, uh, you'll see here. And uh, ROIs are saved as a zip file that can be read directly by ImageJ. So you can call this ROI set uh, nuclei uh, ABIF workshop. And I'll just save it on the desktop for now. Uh, I just have to access this button. Save. OK. Um, which means that if you, uh, there we go, uh, which means that if you want to come back, if you delete these ROIs and you want to come back to them in the future, well, you have this ROI set, uh, so which I can just drag and drop into the main Fiji window, and they all appear, and they'll appear in my ROI manager as well. So that could be really good for, for data management. And um, another very useful property, uh, essentially uh, in your ROI manager, you have the show all. So that can be really useful to see all your cells, but sometimes that can be in the way if you really just want to see which, which ROI you're currently working on. Um, if you say show all, uh, you can click on um, flatten here, this button in the ROI manager. And this is going to generate a new image 
which is going to be uh, an RGB image where all the ROIs are kind of, um, if you want, burnt into the image. So this is saved as a, as a color image with the, the ROIs embedded in there. Um, and this can be handy just to either print up and put in your lab book, or uh, if you keep an, an electric lab, lab notebook, or even just to present during lab meetings, say, well, you know, we can, we can segment nuclei and gives this. Uh, it's a very quick way, and so you can save this as a, simply as a JPEG and throw these in your, in your presentations. And so with that, you'll have, uh, so if you save this as a, as a JPEG, you'll have a visual output of what you did. Uh, if you save your ROIs, you'll have the actual ROIs that you can then use on your image or reapply in the future. And um, you'll also have saved your uh, results tables, so the actual intensity values within these, um, within these nuclei that you segmented. Uh, and so we'll just pause there for a second. Um, There's a question on how you save your um, analysis pipeline, like, that you can use the same steps on the next image. Yes. Um, so uh, yes. that's, that's... I think we can just go back a little bit. There are two questions about how do you get your ROI on your GFP channel? Um, they should appear. Um, what does happen for me, I'll just delete the ROIs and do this again. Um, if I drag and drop the ROIs onto the, uh, the main Fiji window, uh, sometimes it takes a, a moment, uh, and sometimes they don't appear automatically. If you click on your ROI manager and click in the window, sometimes they will appear. So for me, sometimes it doesn't appear naturally. I have to go and click on it, which is kind of strange. Um, yeah. yeah. I guess it's the step before when you got the ROIs and then you open your green channel. Oh. And, then you, and you just need to select your green channel and then click on the ROI. Exactly, yeah. Um, so right now we've worked with separate images. So we had a, a separate image for uh, the, 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 the DNA stain, the nuclei, and a separate image for uh, UHRF1, so the, the GFP signal. Um, when you save a, it's kind of a good point, when you save a region of interest, or when you, when you call a region of interest, it also keeps in mind the, the stack position from which it was taken. So if you did this in a time-lapse or in a 3D image, it will save, uh, it will associate, you know, this shape here with whatever position in the stack that is. Um, so then when you go to another channel, uh, it will sort of remember that it was at that stack. Now that can be handy, of course, because then, well, for us, I mean, in this case, it doesn't matter. There's only one image, so it will, by default, open on the image. Um, but if you had a, a, a two-channel image, that channel will be remembered, essentially. And so if you go to your green, if you would go to your green channel, uh, it would go, it would, and click on the region of interest, it would go back to your, uh, your ROI. So it can be very helpful to work on, on separate images in this case. And so essentially that's it. When you have these, these regions of interest from your, your nuclei, you can go ahead and open any other image. Uh, and these are, these are just shapes with, uh, um, with spatial coordinates. Um, that can then be applied to to any other image. So so then once you open your green channel, you can just go click them on, and um, just move a couple of things, and you can hit click show all to see them or not. You can remove the labels, which can be handy as well, and uh, and sort of get an idea of your results there. And then uh, to get that image, that RGB. Exactly. Yeah, and flatten to get this RGB image here. Uh, yeah. And this doesn't override, this image is, you can't really do analysis on it because it's an RGB image. So all these colors are kind of burnt in, but it's, uh, it's very handy to quickly just show, uh, show some results. So we have two questions, one for saving the settings and another one about um, moving the region to compensate for a drift or, ah. for, um, yeah. Or for um, yeah, uh, chromatic aberrations or something. Um, so to save your pipeline, um, right now we have not done anything to save this pipeline. So uh, so we can't do it with what we just did. Um, what you can do, uh, and what I kind of recommend you do, and uh, you, you can kind of get used to doing, is um, when you before starting your your pipeline, is clicking on plugins, uh, macros and record. Um, so this will open up a little window here. And um, 
So record macro, uh, you can select different languages uh, for that in which it is going to record. By languages, I mean programming languages. Um, unless you're familiar with JavaScript or Java, I'd recommend just leaving the, the, the native macro language. And this is going to record most of the, um, the processes that you give. It's going to be a little bit strange because it's going to record everything. Um, but then uh, it, it can give you kind of a clear idea of, of, of what's happening. So it's even recording things like selecting windows, uh, you know, which is perhaps not the most useful. But then if we go over uh, the whole pipeline really quickly, you'll see these things appear. So let me just delete these. If we start over, uh, and I'll just kind of go quickly, um, we said that we would, uh, we said that we changed the LUTs to gray, for example, so we can do that. Um, we can uh, set a threshold uh, to mean and uh, apply it. And then we said that we would uh, fill the holes. So process binary fill holes. Um, and whoops, let me just reset this. I have a couple of zoom windows in the way. Uh, these are nice. And then we can say analyze, analyze particles. Uh, we have a size limit here that we encoded, pixel units and all these things. We can say okay. And then we have all these. We could even, um, uh, yeah, so then we have all these uh, essentially in, in one kind of go. Um, so this is useful. It's a little bit tricky to read, but this is at least you, you can have this saved and just paste it somewhere. Um, in the future, if you're interested, you can look into um, writing uh, macros or scripts to run some of these things uh, kind of independently. So if you found like a robust thresholding method that seems to work on all your images, um, then you can figure out a way to sort of run this threshold on uh, either on a whole um, directory of, of images, for example. Um, so this can be used for automating once you had something um, reliable. Um, perhaps a quick note on this, on, on programming analysis pipelines. Um, as you sort of do these processing steps, you can try to start to think about what are the processes that really require uh, your human intervention? So you to, to really sort of crit uh, you know, critique these things and say, oh yes, I, I recognize as a human that that is a nucleus, versus what are things that the computer can just do naturally just with a, a, straight, a similar a straight command? What are things that, can, that where can you essentially save on clicks? And so perhaps that can sort of guide you into sort of figuring out where are things, uh, where can things be automated easily? Where do things require a little bit more processing steps? Um, yeah. And then um, to move those regions to compensate for drift, that is a good question. Let's, let's give it a try. Um, there are, we can certainly uh, write things to do that. Um, so let me just remove this. So suppose we uh, take this region of interest here. Um, so we call these regions of interest, this, this yellow shape here, or uh, you can also just consider a selection. And there's a host of, um, of operations that we can do on this selection as well. Uh, and that's in the kind of hidden, it's in the edit menu. So if you click on edit and selection, you're gonna have a sort of variety of, um, of functions here. And so I'm not sure if there's anything that would nudge it um, so let's see, select all, select none. Uh, but you could modify, so there are a lot of things that modify the selection. So for example, if you want to turn, turn into a circle of roughly that shape or fit an ellipse inside it, um, try to make the thing convex, so to get rid of uh, invaginations, uh, things like that. Um, large make band, specify straighten. So I can't find anything that would natively nudge them. What you could do perhaps is um, scale them. So uh, ooh, let's cancel that. So you could scale them so you could make it a little bit larger. So um, you could make it 10% larger by putting a scaling factor of uh, 1.1, perhaps, if you need to compensate for aberration. I've never actually used this, so we'll see exactly how this works out. Um, so yeah, so you could get something a little bit larger um, at the very least. So that would compensate a little bit for drift or uh, chromatic aberration, things like that. Um, the, the next way that I would think of doing it would be to, uh, I believe there would be a way to do it by, by scripting, so by uh, changing the centroid of an object, um, but I'm not quite sure exactly how to do that just yet, but it should be something that would be uh, relatively um, straightforward to do. Um, well, yes? There is a, an option in the ROI manager. Ah, is there? Uh, okay. If you select all of them and then click more, there's the option translate. Ah, very cool. It's not super useful because you have to like know how many pixels you want to move it, but 
Right, right, right. So suppose we say, well, let's say 10 to see a, to see a difference. Oh, very cool. Yes, OK. Ah, nice. Ah, that's very, very handy. Thank you. Cool. OK, yeah, so by selecting them and just saying uh, more and translate. Awesome. That's a good example how we never know everything about a software, too. I know I've been using Metamore forever, and I love watching someone else use it because I'll find some new shortcuts or mm -hmm. new ways to do something. So. Yeah. Thank you, Mikhail. This is great. OK. Um, so uh, there, there's one last thing that I want to talk about that, uh, oops, well, um, one last thing that we can talk about, uh, and it's sort of considering the intensities within the within the, the nuclei. So I'll just uh, I will delete the ROIs because I, I translated them, and just uh, reopen. Uh, oops. Hmm. Just reopen some of these uh, these ROIs here, and have a lot of windows open, so perhaps I'll close a couple <laughs> just to make it a little bit more manageable. Uh, I did a good job of clearing my desktop before this, but uh, the, the windows do accumulate. Um, so if we take all these, these objects and measure them, uh, we get all these intensities here. And um, what we just want to get you to, to, to think about is to, when, you're, when you're thinking about the, the relative intensities between the nuclei. And so all the values, all these, these mean intensities here vary between 600 and uh, 900. And so if you were to just take those values, uh, those intensity values at face value, um, let's say we consider values in uh, uh, ROIs 1 and 2. So let's just get, let's delete those and just get those for a second. It'll be a little bit easier to see if it's uncluttered. Look at that, we got that. Um, and so if you look at these, the intensities of these two uh, nuclei, well, we have you know, around 600 and uh, close to 1,000, so it's so around 900. And so if you just take those intensities, you would say, oh, well, it looks like um, cell number two here is, uh, let's say, 1.5 times brighter than cell number one. And um, what we sort of want to point out here is that depending on your imaging setting, that might be really, really off, simply because um, a lot of cells, uh, sorry, a lot of, uh, of images um, have a, an intrinsic background to them. So usually when you acquire images with a camera-based system, there's a background intensity to them. So even if you image with no light, no fluorescence, no anything, there'd be a background intensity. And then there's often a little bit of background in the cells themselves. So in these ESCs, for example, there's a tiny bit of fluorescence uh, between the cells. And so it's worthwhile just to make a region of interest uh, between, your, uh, between your cells and just take a measurement and get an idea of what is the intensity uh, between the cells. So we can do something like that there, press one here. And you can see here that the background is already at 600 or close to 600, um, meaning that even if there was no light at all, you would measure an intensity of 600. So um, it's important to subtract these, these background values from your, your measured intensities to get the true relative um, uh, intensities of your, of your shapes. So in this case, it would not be a ratio of, uh, 900 to 600, but rather, an, uh, you know, 600 minus 600, so uh, to so something like 25 values, so very, very dim to something around 375 or 400. So that means that the ratio is much greater than what would be suggested here. So it's, it's really, really important to get an idea of what is the background intensities that you get when you're, you're not expecting signal uh, in order to compute your, your intensity measurements. So we'll pause there for a second. Um, I'll ask my co-hosts uh, if they have uh, any particular things that they want to sort of tighten or or or, or mention, because um, we kind of went quickly at the end there. But uh, we'll just to uh, did we save the results? Uh, we we did, but we can do that again. Um, so once we have this uh, this table open again, since we can't really do much with this directly, you can actually select this data and you can copy paste it into an Excel uh, uh, spreadsheet. So depending on how you're doing, how your workflow is, perhaps it's just handy to uh, copy and paste into a into a uh, into a uh, spreadsheet. Um, however, it's also 
I would highly recommend just doing file save as, and again, saving either as an XLS or a CSV file, which you can then operate um, in, uh, uh, in another data analysis software. So um, if you have any further questions, uh, we'll be happy to take them. Um, perhaps I'll, yeah, Let's see what's happening. Um, going to ask if you could show how to correct the background intensity on the image and then do the measurement. Certainly, yeah. Um, so there's a there is a function in image data which is which is pretty good and it, it, it is quite handy. Um, let's see. Uh, so we'll delete these. Um, so there's a couple of ways. Um, I think the, 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 the most reliable way to do this is to apply a background subtraction um, uh, uh, function, which is natively encoded in, in Fiji. And this can be ha ha handy in a lot of, uh, in, in many situations. Um, so that's under uh, process and subtract background. And this is gonna pop up a window that we're gonna have to uh, deal with a little bit. Um, so you'll notice here, uh, the idea here is to have kind of a, an adaptive background to kind of um, even out the image a little bit. Um, and what we need here is, uh, is, to, is to put in a, a, a size uh, for which it's going to filter out the image, for which it's going to consider a background. And simply how it works is that for each pixel, it's going to find the median of its neighboring pixels and subtract that median from that pixel and then do it for each pixel one after another. And so what we want to say here is what is the, the size of or how many pixels around each pixel do we want to consider a median to consider the background? Um, so this is a little bit, uh, so th this, this goes into the, the, the ways of filtering and, and analyzing your data, but it can be extremely, extremely handy and extremely powerful. And sort of to, to give you a general sort of rule of thumb, um, we want to have, uh, we want to choose a size of this so-called rolling ball um, at least roughly twice the size of our objects in our image. Um, so for something like this, our images are about 50 to 100 pixels. Uh, so we want to have something that's at least, uh, you know, at least 150. So 1.5 to twice the size. So we just go ahead and put a large radius here of say, I don't know, say 101. Um, uh, sometimes it's useful to have a, uh, an odd number. And, um, and you can click on preview here and sort of get an idea of what happens here. And so you can see that the, the background kind of uh, equilibrates throughout the image. The sort of the fluorescence, there's a little bit more fluorescence in the center here compared to the edges uh, that you can kind of see disappear. And so we can say, okay, and it's gonna, it's gonna, it will apply that. And now this is really good. The intensity will be close to zero and it will get some zeros, but it won't be zero because there are fluctuations. And so we'll maintain fluctuations in the image, um, which means that your background is not at zero. You'll still have to get a background value here, but it makes the, the image a little bit more even and can make your, your analysis a little bit more even as well. Uh, so if we just measure this background here, we still have values around uh, you know, 70 or 75 instead of 500. Um, and so this actually changes the pixel values in your image, um, but it maintains the, the, the fluctuations. So it's still, you still kind of need to go in and figure out what is the, the, the background, the cellular background that you want to subtract. You can't really apply that. I wouldn't recommend applying it directly to the image because ImageJ really modifies the images in, in, in such a way. Um, and since you're in 8-bit or in 16-bit, you won't get negative values and stuff like that. So this is more, a little bit more on the illumination side. Um, now this process can be extremely handy uh, if you have um, if you have images that have a lot of a lot of background or a lot of out of focus light. So here I artificially generated uh, uh, a background, uh, or sorry, uh, a lot of out of focus light here on this image on the right, uh, which I can show by just increasing the contrast. There's a lot more glare, so you can imagine this would happen a little bit more with uh, with wild field fluorescence. Um, and just to give you an example, if I try to apply a threshold as we did before, uh, it's a little bit tricky. Just by using automatically the mean, you get a little bit more of these uh, nuclei that are touching, you get a lot more of these bright signals here. And it kind of makes sense. It's gonna be difficult to find a, a threshold that just gets the cells, a single threshold value that gets just the cells, but not this, uh, this glare here. Um, and so to correct for that, we can use that same background subtraction function. So that's process subtract background. 
um, again, a, a large radius that, that encompasses our objects of interest. And you can kind of just give it a try if you want. If you put a very narrow radius, you're going to get rid of a lot of your objects. So suppose we just put a radius of three pixels. Oh, it's not showing the, oh, there it is. We lose a lot of the, the internal information. We get kind of like those denser structures. And if we put a larger radius, we get something a little bit bigger. Um, I'll just say, and uh, just say, okay. And so if we compare this to uh, the original image, um, we get rid fairly significantly of a lot of that glare. And in some cases that can make uh, the segmentation a little bit easier. So these two nuclei are less connected and it'll be easier to get our, our intensity values from those. So that can be one uh, filtering method that can get rid of sort of these large illumination artifacts. Um, and perhaps I'll just stop with, with, uh, with one last thing in, uh, simply because it was discussed uh, a little bit in those videos that we talked about and it was sort of brought up. Um, in some cases, you'll work with images that don't quite have uh, as, as high a signal to noise as these ones. So I, I took this image and I added a bunch of noise to it. And so I'll show you here. Uh, so we just added some random Gaussian noise, uh, which would be uh, analogous to having either uh, less fluorophore in the cell or a lower exposure time or using a lower laser intensity. And this might look a lot more like some of the images that, that you do end up getting um, with a lot of this uh, salt and pepper noise here. And so if we just tried to apply the, 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 the threshold directly, uh, you can imagine that this won't work all that well because there's a lot of noisy pixels all over the place. We get all these guys here, which kind of renders it rather messy. Um, so what we can do for this, uh, and we'll just go over this quickly, but you can, uh, but it'll give you kind of a clear idea. I'll just duplicate it here. Um, what we recommend doing here is, is applying a, a median filter. And so if we kind of zoom in, you can see there's a, there's a, there's a few individual bright pixels and you know, uh, and we sort of want to, uh, suppress those a little bit. And so what we can do is apply a convolution filter that for each pixel, suppose this, this bright pixel here, we're going to replace its value with the median of its surrounding pixels. And so that's going to, and the medi median is a statistic that is uh, extremely robust to outliers. So that means it's going to find that sort of middle value and not be influenced too much. Um, so if we, if we do that, uh, you can see here, there's a few bright pixels here. We can do that simply by um, clicking on process, filters, and median. In this case, the, 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 the noise that we want to get rid of is this, these, these sort of uh, these single pixel fluctuations. So here we want a very small radius, um, essentially a, well, a radius of one pixel. So only take the median of the, the surrounding pixels, one, or you could put 1.5 or two. Uh, uh, if we click um, preview, you can see that some of these bright pixels kind of disappear. The image looks weird. It's not visually the same as before but it can be extremely useful for segmenting simply because uh, this was the original noisy image. This is the filtered image. Now, if I just go and uh, apply a threshold, uh, try to, to find a threshold, uh, then we get a much cleaner value almost, almost out of the box. So it's not perfect, but we get rid of a lot of, uh, a lot of artifacts there. So this is one of the manipulations you can do to suppress a little bit the noise and get, a, get cleaner regions of interest as well. And this will be in the pre-processing step before applying the, uh, the thresholds. Yeah, so we have questions about um, what's accepted. Um, if a filter is median, is, uh, is linear, would it be okay to apply? Um, so I, I guess um, he'll uh, reply that, you know, I think we should apply um, those for segmenting and mm -hmm. maybe not for analyzing for a sense intensity. So I don't know if you want to comment. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I think the methods accepted by journals, uh, you know, as long as you're um, uh, perhaps uh, Claire or people with more uh, experience in publishing than me can uh, discuss, uh, I guess in general, just as long as you're clear about what are the processes that you did, uh, it's fine. Where I think it gets kind of dubious if it's just say, oh, we processed images in in image J, and then you just give these crazy numbers kind of all over the place from images that look extremely noisy or, or something like that. So once you're clear with your methods, um, I think that's generally okay. Um, and that also allows people to say, oh, well, that I don't believe that that's the right way to do it. Perhaps you should do it this way, and then you can get into an argument with people. Um, now, uh, so yes, yeah, it's more to be precise. So let's see. I could maybe just comment if you want. Please, yeah. Um, so I think uh, that's, yeah, you've got it exactly right. Like anything you do should be 
recorded and listed in your materials and methods so people know exactly what you've done to the images. And as uh, Miguel said, a lot of times this is done to do the segmentation and create the regions and then you go back to the raw data mm -hmm. to do the intensity measurements. Mm -hmm. I've always done the intensity measurements on the raw data and I've also worried about the linearity of median filters and I actually tend to prefer low pass because it's more of a blurring to get rid of the noise rather than a yeah. calculating individual numbers. But I mean, it still changes the numbers, but, mm -hmm. but then I had a, a, a conversation with a, another researcher who felt that leaving the noise there would actually also give you a bias because it's going to make your intensities look a lot higher than they are with these bright pixels that are not really fluorescent. So I think it's a, it's an interesting question. And I guess the, the higher the, or the lower your signal to noise, the more important it is. Um, but I know um, for the background correction, I think for the actual analysis, I would normally just do a, a subtraction of a single value. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what you showed, the background correction there, also takes care of field uh, curvature or sort of um, you know differences in intensity due to the optics and the light source and so on. So certainly, it's a bit tricky, I think. Uh, yeah. But it definitely need to be careful and. Mm -hmm. um, follow the same steps every time as well. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so I agree, being, uh, being consistent and then just being very clear about the steps that were, that were done. Um, and again, there are multiple ways to go about this. Uh, you know, uh, leaving the noise can also affect the intensity, as you can you talk about that. Um, there was discussion that the median filter is nonlinear, and that's, that's totally true. Uh, and as Michelle sort of uh, also answered in the chat. Um, most of these processes, these filtering steps, we don't use it for the for the measuring. So here we applied a filter. We can use the fil uh, the median, or we can use a low pass filter, as as Claire suggested. And this is just to get these kind of shapes. Now, uh, even though these shapes aren't perfect, they have a little bit of of edginess to it. If you do this on ten thousand cells, and you get ten thousand cells like this uh, in all your conditions, that should be good enough to be able to get intensity values from uh, from a different cell. So either from the raw image or as we're doing here, uh, you know, we're not actually in measuring the intensity of, of, the, of the DNA, we're applying these shapes to another image. Um, so to, to do the processing is, I think is fine, so long as you're clear about what you're doing. And then if people disagree with you, well, then you sort of discuss why you did it and maybe you, you find out about a better way to do it or, or a different way to do it. Um, so there, there, there are gonna be multiple different ways to, to, to sort of get to this, to these, uh, to these numbers. Okay. Um, I think that kind of covers it. What do you, oh, we have a couple more questions. We have to take some questions, of course. Um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, David asked, uh, does the term segmentation refer to the process of identifying slash selecting ROIs? Um, perhaps Claire and Anne-Marie and Michelle, you'd be better at uh, talking about that because, um, uh, you know, I, I, I've been working for the past few years in a non-native English speaking lab. And so these, a lot of these terms tend to be kind of jumbled together. So perhaps you have a better, a clearer idea of uh, what would be what this what would be the the right term here so to me segmentation means separating your image in a foreground and a background so you're creating a binary image where your foreground are your nuclei your cells your plant roots whatever you're interested in and the background is the part of the image that you don't want to measure or you're not interested in cool <laughs> that sounds perfect yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> nailed it <laughs> um, let's see, is there a way to segment two populations of structures in an image in one step, or should we do the segmentation sequentially for one structure and then the other? Um, so to me, it will, this will depend on what the structures look like. Right. Um, so if you have, uh, two populations of cells, uh, and you know you have uh, very very small cells and very big cells. You could segment them all in one step, and maybe just by based on the size of the the object, you can figure out if it's from one population or the next. Um, if it's so, it, it sort of depends what sort of uh, biological structure is here. Um, 
your segmentation is going to give you a binary image with objects. Now, how how you there thereby take them uh, into something else uh, kind of depends uh, if they're if they're identifiable, right? Um, you know, if you have yeah. So depending on their shapes or on, on intensities or things like that. If you're, I, I, I think if you would be segmenting uh, different structures that have very different intensities, it might be difficult to uh, threshold in one step, uh, or at least it might be difficult to find a threshold that would work for both of them, but it will very much depend on the image, uh, I think. Yeah, so either you would um, do it in two steps on the image, or if you can like convert your image into numbers and then you can make a separation between the two structures number wise you could always do it in excel or graphpad or whichever you know analysis program you're using certainly yeah. to do your data analysis for that part but it really depends specifically on the type of question you're asking cool any more questions There's one, one last question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a cool one. Um, so suppose you had a four leaf clover, uh, let's say it's flat and you, uh, you wanna get all the individual leaves. Um, well, I, I, I don't know. So uh, for something like this, uh, just kind of conceptually, I would assume that you would, uh, if you would segment and get the, the entire clover, so all four leaves in one big object, you could then uh, split them up into four, possibly with some sort of um, uh, watershed uh, modality. Um, or if you can figure out a step that, uh, that can divide it into four, um, four parts, each of a certain size. Um, I don't quite know off the top of my head, but Claire seems to have a, I have a guess. I don't know if it would work, but um, one of the neat tools that people use to remove objects of different shapes is eroding and dilating. Mm, yes. You could imagine if you took the four leaf clover and eroded a little bit, maybe the, the, um, I don't know if they would separate though. The four, the four leaves might not separate in that way. I should have to try. Yeah, they should though, because the, the area where they connect is going to be smaller than the, the leaf part. So Most you likely, yeah. Erode it away by a few pixels and then mm -hmm. dilate it back out to get your four leaves back. Yeah, so yeah, just, yeah. Just to guess if something could try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets complicated very fast. I think what STARDIS does for separating you know, nuclei that overlap is they look for centers of mass, I believe. I'm not entirely sure. And so, gradients yeah. within the structure. So there's you know a lot. Mm -hmm. This is really the the basics, the very, you know, straightforward filtering steps you can do, but you mm -hmm. can do um, a lot more complicated mm -hmm. stuff. So Alka, I think the watershed would work if you had intensity, an intensity change at the edge of the leaves, but mm -hmm. like where they connect, but it's the watershed's based on having a dip or a peak in, and usually a dip in the intensity to identify the, where to break things up. Mm -hmm. And there's also a, a good comment about um, local backgrounds. And of course, if you have uh, some sort of staining, it's possible that it's not going to be even in this in the cell in the nuclei or on your on your camera or whatever detector. So Certainly. yeah, so important to keep that in mind. It's all going to depend on what you need at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah. So for a lot, and yeah, for a lot of things that are kind of different, uh, so for a lot of things where you do have an uneven background or things like that, uh, you have to figure out if you can actually reliably correct for it straight, straight up on the image, or if you have to go get some sort of measurement on your microscope, um, sort of see how uneven the illumination is or what sort of noise you have or, or things like that. Um, but is it, but it's a, yeah, it's an excellent comment that, yeah, um, things can be uneven and, uh, and thus a single threshold might not work for everywhere on your image um, and so you can sort of look at if you're if you are interested in these sort of things you can also look at uh, so ways to do flat fielding so to either try to get even illumination uh, either from your image or artificial uh, sorry either on your microscope or kind of computationally from your image um, alternatively 
Oh, just forgot my thought. Um, that would be one one solution. The uh, example you showed would do that too. That that background subtraction with a read yeah. should take care of some of that. Right? You're totally right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah background subtraction on on that would work as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> We're getting close to five. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions or? There's a question, when's the next workshop? <laughs> <laughs> we'll start planning tomorrow. <laughs> well, we'll so I, I mentioned in the, in the email today that um, we'll, we'll send you a brief survey. So it would be great if you could fill it out with your feedback. And um, we're definitely planning an, a follow-up on this, you know, getting more into specific uh, analysis pipelines. Um, we were thinking right now to do tracking as a next step, but if you know none of you want to are interested in tracking and everyone <laughs> wants to do 3D segmentation, let us know. Um, we're happy to take suggestions and we'll see what we can do. And of course, if anyone is working on very specific problems for their research, you can always um, contact us and we can see how we can you know, contribute to your image analysis. So we'll put the recording on our uh, ABIF newly created YouTube channel and <laughs> we can send you the link for that. So. Great.